So this is my very first atelier, so I'm uh, very excited to be participating in this new kind of event, even though I missed the first half. Um, so uh, so uh, what, what I'm going to be talking about um, is really about a uh, pair of natural moduli spaces associated to a, uh, a closed-oriented surface, that's the S and a Lie group G. Uh, in fact, it's really one space that has sort of two different uh, representations. Um, so, but like with any topological space, maybe the, uh, the first question you might be interested in is the number of components, um, and that's really what I'm going to be talking about. And we'll see that um, for these modular spaces, this question about components has sort of two aspects. There's uh, what I've called here a, a mundane aspect uh, where... Uh, there are um, obvious topological labels that are obviously constant on connected components. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, sort of there's no surprises there. But there's also what I called an exotic contribution to this number of uh, connected components, where you see components that are not detected by the obvious topological invariants. And that's sort of really the subject matter. Um, these moduli spaces, uh, I'll say more about what they are in a minute, but one of the perspectives is from Higgs bundles, and uh, that's what I'll be talking about here. So these will be moduli spaces of Higgs bundles that we'll be talking about. Um, so uh, really, I hope the high point of the talk will be discussion of a, <clears throat> a new result um, that's joint with Brian, Brian Collier, Oscar Garcia Prada, Peter Gothen, and Andre Oliveira. Um, where we have uh, detected some new exotic components in the moduli spaces associated to this group, SOPQ. And we'll see that sort of part of the reason that this is interesting is because uh, th there are sort of two well-known sources of exotic components for various classes of groups, and this group doesn't lie in either of those up till now well-known sources. So there's something new going on here. Um, but so before we can get to that, uh, there's a certain amount of uh, scene setting and background that we'll go through. Um, so the plan is basically to you know, tell you a bit about these moduli spaces, say something about um, the ways um, that exotic components are known to arise, um, and then tell you something a little bit more about uh, these new results. Um, so that's the plan. Um, so uh, let me just try and tell you a little bit just what we need to know about these moduli spaces. Um, so the, the two of them, the one is a representation variety, so um, homomorphisms from the fundamental group of the surface into the group G, um, module up to conjugation. Uh, and the other one is a moduli space of Higgs bundles. So Higgs bundles I'll say more about in a minute, but these are holomorphic bundles with some, some extra structure. So this is a different, seems like a very different sort of beast. Um, the relation between these two, I mean, this bridge is a result of, you know, big theorems. This is the non-abelian Hodge correspondence. So uh, this is the non-abelian version of uh, what Alex was talking about uh, earlier today, uh, the, the, the linear Hodge theory correspondence. So these spaces are not linear spaces, so that's, the non, so that's sort of related to the non-abelian. Um, G, right. So, so S is a closed-oriented surface of genus bigger than one, and G is, in principle, any reductive Lie group. But for this talk, really, these are the ones we're going to see. So it's going to be SLNC or um, special orthogonal group or some of the real forms of those groups. Um, but this does fit into a, a, a wider setting, but uh, that won't appear much in this talk. You'll notice that in both of these moduli spaces, there's some adornment here. Uh, here there's a plus, and here there's this word polystable. Um, and I'm not going to say too much about either of those, except that um, so these are the conditions that you need in order to get nice moduli spaces. I mean, both of these are parameterizing equivalence classes of objects. Uh, here the equivalence class is by uh, action of conjugation of G on space of homomorphisms. And in general, if you just take the full set of, of, of equivalence classes, you don't get a nice geometric space. You have to impose some restriction. And this, is the restrict this means reductive representation. And here, the restriction is inspired by geometric invariant theory. 
So those are the two uh, spaces, and we want to understand the uh, connected components of the well of, of both because they're um, homeomorphic. Sorry. Ah, it's any n. Doesn't matter. Yeah, we'll see that when n is two, it's a little bit special. But uh, in any any n, yeah. Um, uh, there was one other thing I was going to say. Oh yeah. So notice here that uh, uh, the the here all we have is the surface and the group. So this is sort of purely topological data. Here we have to fix a complex structure on the surface, so turn it into a Riemann surface, and that's what allows us to talk about holomorphic objects over here. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so as I said, the focus for today is going to be on uh, sp the connected components, so pi zero, and we're going to be focusing mostly on this side of this correspondence. Um, okay, so uh, let me tell you a bit about what Higgs bundles are. Um, so there's a, there's a notion of them for any G. Uh, it's somewhat easier to state for uh, SLNC, and then I'll say something about how you modify that for groups that are, you know, subgroups of SLNC. So uh, we've fixed a complex structure, so now we have a Riemann surface, and then a Higgs bundle on the Riemann surface is a pair consisting of a holomorphic bundle, so a rank N holomorphic bundle. The determinant is fixed to be trivial, that's related to the S there. If that was a G, then you wouldn't fix the determinant. Uh, and the Higgs field, the extra piece of data, um, he has one description of it. It's a holomorphic map from the bundle to the bundle twisted by the canonical bundle. So this is the um, holomorphic cotangent bundle of the surface with a restriction on the trace. So this locally is just a matrix of one forms. The trace restriction here is also related to the S there. It's telling you that this lies in the Lie algebra of SLNC. Uh, the important things we need to know about these Higgs bundles are, um, so here we have a holomorphic bundle, a Higgs field. If we add an extra piece of geometric data, a metric on the bundle, then that combined with the other defining data allows you to define connections. Here the D is the churn connection, so that's determined by the holomorphic structure and the metric, but then it's modified by the Higgs field. Uh, so this defines special metrics built on the Higgs bundle. The stability notion, which I mentioned as necessary for building the moduli spaces, ensures that you can uh, find a preferred metric, actually satisfying a harmonic condition, which uh, has the consequence that this connection is flat. And so that, that establishes the connection between stable Higgs bundles and uh, local systems, and therefore representations of the fundamental group. So that's a key part of this non-abelian Hodge bridge. Um, Right, so then you can, I mean, this, this makes sense, but then you have to add an extra condition that the, the square of phi vanishes, phi which phi is zero. There's an extra condition. But... Uh, uh, um, it's not taking values in the canonical bundle, it's the one and zero. Right, right. Right, right. But we're not going to go up in dimension. Um, okay, so that's for SLNC. If you uh, want to take a subgroup of SLNC, uh, the way this description changes is you impose extra restrictions which you can interpret as designed so that the holonomy of these flat connections lies in the group that you're interested in. Um, and what that translates into, uh, in some cases, is, is uh, on this slide. So for SLNC, you have a, a, just a bundle with fixed determinant and a Higgs field with a trace condition. Uh, if you want holonomy in SONC, uh, the bundle has to have an orthogonal structure, and the Higgs field has to be skew-symmetric with respect to that orthogonal structure. And then the connections that you get from that will have the right holonomy. Um, if you want to restrict to real forms of these complex groups, you have to impose extra restrictions on the Higgs bundles. In the case of SLNR, um, the rank N bundle again has to have an orthogonal structure, but the Higgs field now has to be symmetric, not skew-symmetric. 
Um, and in the case that is really sort of the star of the talk, the SOPQs, um, the uh, rank N bundle, so, I mean the rank P plus Q bundle, has to de be decomposed as uh, a sum of a rank P and a rank Q, both of which have orthogonal structures, so the orthogonal structure decomposes in this way. And the Higgs field has to be compatible with this decomposition in this, in this, so it has to look like this. The T here means the transpose with respect to these orthogonal structures. So, uh, which objects? So, so, so phi is the Higgs field, so that's a, a map from V to V twisted by the canonical bundle. And Q is the orthogonal structure that uh, appears when the group that we're talking about is the uh, orthogonal group. So Q is, an orth is, a, is a symmetric bilinear form that defines an orthogonal structure on the bundle. Orthogonal. No, there's no Q here because this is the Higgs bundle for SLNC. So here we don't need any we don't need any more data other than what I've described here in order for these connections to phi is a right phi is a bundle map from v to v twisted by the canonical bundle so v is over sigma right phi phi is uh, it's an endomorphism of, if the k wasn't there phi would just be an endomorphism of the bundle bundle endomorphism Covers the identity, right? Yeah. The, you can formulate those conditions in that way, yeah. Right, right. So locally, this is a matrix of one forms, and uh, the those those descriptions are related by SLNC transition functions in this, for this case. Because you want, the, you want this to take values in the Lie algebra of this group. That's related to where you want the holonomy of this thing to lie. And why is what? That's also related to the S here. It's a, I mean, you, you want, yeah, yeah. So then the next five G is general? N well, no, here, G in this line is SLNC, in this line it's SO. And then Q? Q is the new, the new ingredient that you need to distinguish these Higgs bundles from those. Uh, and I'm advocating you interpret this as the condition you need so that the connections you build have holonomy not in SLNC but in this subgroup of, S of SLNC. Okay. So um, these things have uh, moduli spaces uh, whose components we want to understand. Um, the story is different for the case of G complex and G real, as we'll see. Um, let me start with uh, the co moduli spaces for complex G. Um, here's has uh, you know classical semi-simple uh, Lie groups that are covered by this. Um, so these spaces have many interesting properties. I've listed just some, some of them here, uh, not all of which are going to be relevant in this talk. Uh, they, uh, they, I mean, they're, they're, they're complex analytic spaces, but they actually have a hypercalous structure. Uh, they also have these two. Sorry, what's MG? MG is the moduli space of polystable G Higgs bundles. Uh, sig sigma, the Riemann surface is fixed, and uh, the uh, topological type of the bundle is fixed. We'll see. We'll get to that. Uh, right. We're very. If you, from one point of view, we're varying the pair, the holomorphic structure, and the Higgs field. Yeah and we're looking at isomorphism classes of those objects. If you take just all isomorphism classes that doesn't have an, a nice geometric structure, but you impose a notion of stability, throw out the unstable ones, and then what's left, 
does form an oxygen moduli space. It's, uh, it's, not, it's not always smooth. So when I say hypercalar structure, I mean on the smooth locus. Um, in all cases, though, it has a very convenient C star action, which you get by acting just on the Higgs field, scaling that by non-zero complex numbers. It also has a very convenient function uh, you get by evaluating the L2 norm of the Higgs field. Uh, I mean, I put Morse function in, in quotes here because this is, uh, you know, when this isn't a smooth manifold, then you can't really be doing um, Morse theory, but you can extract topological information anyway from some of the properties of this function, and that will come up later in the talk. So that will play a role later in the talk. The other thing that we'll be using is this other feature of these moduli spaces, which is a vibration over a vector space, which turns out to be of half the dimension of these spaces, and such that the fibers of this uh, vibration are generically abelian varieties. So generically means there are some singular fibers where that's not true, but um, away from the singular locus, there are abelian varieties. This uh, map is, is defined by taking invariant polynomials and evaluating them on the Higgs, on the Higgs field. Um, and uh, we'll see that this fibration, so this vibration has um, uh, you know, ma many wonderful properties, including being a convenient setting for understanding mirror symmetry. That's not something that we're going to say anything more about in this talk, but this, this structure will play a role in understanding some of the connected components. Um, so, so these are all the, uh, you know, interesting aspects of the space. The one aspect that is not so interesting for these complex, for moduli spaces for complex groups is the set of connected components. Um, in the case of the complex groups, <clears throat> there's really only uh, obvious topological invariants that appear and uh, they do label connected components. So there's not much in the story uh, for those moduli spaces. Oops, sorry. Right, so the, the, the critical points for this function are actually the fixed points for that C star action. The, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a Morse bot function, I should say. I mean, the, the critical sets, the critical points are not isolated, but there are critical submanifolds. Um, the, the main thing that we use about this is that it's a proper map, so it attains its minimum on every connected component. And that's, that's the way that it's going to be used here. And that statement is true whether the space is smooth or not. Um, OK, so good. So yeah, uh, please keep the questions coming. Uh, slow me down if, if necessary. Um, OK, so um, when the group is a real form of uh, those complex groups that we just saw, the, uh, the, the story about connected components gets considerably more interesting. A certain amount remains the same. Uh, I mean, the, the, this is still a moduli space of bundles with extra structure. Um, but uh, since th there are um, uh, principal G bundles underlying these Higgs bundles, those have topological invariants, uh, characteristic classes. And those must be constant on connected components. So um, th those are the obvious, those are the, the, the obvious invariants uh, that partially label connected components of the moduli space. They decompose this space. So you know, I, I hesitate to use the word component because the whole point of this is that th these labeled by uh, characteristic classes are not necessarily connected. Um, but it does give you this decomposition where C is just here generically standing for whatever characteristic classes are appropriate for the G you're talking about. Um, but what's new when the group is real is, uh, so there's sort of several phenomena that appear. Um, on the one hand, in some cases, turns out that there are too many of these invariants. There are bounds that they have to satisfy in order for these components to be non-empty. So not all invariants can appear. Um, the, the opposite phenomenon also occurs where uh, there are too few of these. In other words, they fail to distinguish all the connected components. Um, 
There's also a phenomenon in occurs for these uh, real cases where some of the components that appear have special geometric significance. The, uh, we'll see in the example that I look at in a second, uh, sort of the, uh, the first and sort of prime example of this is that one of the components is a copy of Teichmuller space, um, but there are other geometric structures that are also detected by some, some of the special components that appear for special real forms. Um, so that's, uh, that's sort of the, the, the overall general setting of the type of question that we want to look at um, lives in. Um, so let me start by describing some of the phenomena in the case of SL2R. So let's look at this example. Um, uh, this is you know, historically maybe the first one, but also we see essentially every, all the phenomena uh, appearing in this example. Um, so now we're looking at, uh, you know, from the one point of view, it's the moduli space of SL2R Higgs bundles, which by this non-abelian Hodge theory correspondence is the representation variety for the fundamental group. Uh, that should have been an S, not a sigma, because we don't need the holomorphic structure here, into SL2R. Uh, there, I've made it an S there. Um, so from uh, so this was uh, this goes back to work of Bill Goldman, um, who gave the uh, count of the number of components for this representation variety, and here it is. So this is uh, on for a surface of genus G. So the number of components is here. This number two to the two G plus one plus two G minus three, um, and so we'll understand that a little bit as we go down the slide. Um, so the obvious invariant here is, I mean, these, these representations and these Higgs bundles um, have associated to them an Euler number, so essentially an Euler number of a SL2R, of an, S, of an uh, SO2 bundle. Um, so that's an integer. Uh, turns out that there is a bound on this integer. So here we see the, the, the topological uh, invariant, the, the too many aspect. Uh, the bound is G minus 1 uh, for the components where the invariant is not maximal. Uh, that, those actually are labeled by that invariant, so those are connected. But for the maximal ones, there are 2 to the 2G components all corresponding to that, uh, that value of the invariant, each one of which is a copy of Teichmuller space. Um, so that's what you see from the representation variety point of view. Uh, how does this look from the uh, perspective of Higgs bundles, uh, which is the perspective that we're going to uh, extend when we look at other groups? Um, so first of all, uh, what, does an, what does an SL2R Higgs bundle look like? So you, you probably don't remember from the table, but this is a rank 2 bundle. That's the 2. But because it's an SL2R, it's a rank 2 bundle that has to have an orthogonal structure. And that can always be put in this standard form, a line bundle plus its dual. Um, so the Higgs bundle is a li line bundle plus its dual. The Higgs field has to be uh, um, uh, symmetric with respect to the orthogonal structure defined in this standard form, which turns out to mean that it has to be off diagonal like this. Each one of these pieces in the Higgs field is a section of a line bundle, the line bundle determined by L in the canonical bundle. So that's the data that defines the Higgs bundles. There's you know, the topological invariant staring at you here uh, in, the, in this line bundle. It's the degree of that line bundle. Um, the bound on that is uh, very accessible from the Higgs bundle point of view um, because the stability notion, which I didn't defined for you implies that one, at, one or other of these components cannot vanish. Which one depends on whether the degree is positive or negative. But the fact that it can't vanish puts a bound on the degree of the bundle of which it's a section, because uh, line bundles can only have sections if their degree is non-negative. Um, so that's where the bound comes from. So you get a decomposition of the modular space of Higgs bundles into pieces labeled by the degree of this bundle L, um, and 
uh, because uh, like beta is a map from L inverse to L uh, tensor K. Yeah, well, it, no, it, it, it reinforces it. <laughs> it's a map from L inverse to L tensor K, so it's a section of L squared K, and the other one is of L minus 2K. Um, so when, when the, when the uh, parameter is maximal, then the degree of one of these is zero, and so to have a section, it has to actually be the trivial bundle. So the structure of the bundle actually specializes. It can't, it's, not, it's not determined just by its degree. It also has to be a square root of the canonical bundle. Um, and that means that uh, the description of the maximal components um, change, is different from the other components. Um, there's now one component for each choice of the square root of the canonical bundle, and each one of them is determined just by the piece of information that hasn't been used yet, um, namely a section of uh, this uh, uh, square of the canonical bundle, so by a quadratic differential. Um, and uh, so this identifies these components with a copy of the space of quadratic differentials. These are the Hitchin components. This is, uh, this is actually the identification of uh, Teichmuller space with the space of quadratic differentials that, uh, that Mike Wolf was also responsible for originally. Um, but this is seen from the Higgs bundle point of view. Um, and you see 2 to the 2G copies of it corresponding to the choices of the canonical bundle. Um, so uh, there are many different phenomena at work here, uh, and this is a re really a reflection of the fact that uh, SL2R lies in, uh, you know, he wears many different hats. Um, there are many low-dimensional isomorphisms uh, at work here. SL2R is the same as SP2R, and it's a double cover of SO12. Uh, it's also, you can also identify it with SU11, but that wasn't essential for this story, so I didn't put it here. These groups all lie in bigger families. This one is in the SP2NRs, this one SLNR. This one actually can be viewed, uh, should be viewed as lying in two different families. In the one case, uh, it's the SO2Qs, so we're keeping two fixed, and the other is uh, SOPP plus one. Um, both of those are special cases of the group that we eventually want to talk about. So uh, the groups that you see here uh, live in, uh, I mean, there's some special features that are the important things here. Um, some of them, the ones in blue here, are like SLNR, are the split real forms of their complex groups, um, while others, um, so you should look at this one and that one. This is in purple because it lies in both these families, but these groups are distinguished by, I mean, I've called them Hermitian. What it refers to is that the uh, symmetric space you get from these quotients by their maximal compact is a Hermitian symmetric space. Um, so those, these, two, these two features are the ones that are known to be responsible for special components. I'll say more about that in a minute. Uh, you'll notice that, that this one didn't get, wasn't either blue or red. So this is, uh, this is where the, uh, the novelty is appearing here. Um, OK, so let me just say something about uh, both of these um, mechanisms that are at work in the component story. Uh, let's see. OK. Um, so what is special about the, uh, the split real forms? So here's a list of uh, the real forms that are, you know, fall into this category for the various uh, classical groups. Um, here I've reminded you what the Higgs bundles for SL2R look like. Um, in uh, the, what the Higgs bundles that live in the special exotic components look like, I should say. Um, there is some of the, the bundle is a sum of line bundles, but the line bundle is the square root of the canonical bundle, so some power of k, and uh, the Higgs field is constrained uh, 
to not, I mean, the, 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 the term that lies over there has to be nowhere zero, and this one can be anything, and that's where the parameterization comes from. Uh, the way this generalizes is, uh, so there's a description on, in terms of the representation variety and in terms of the Higgs bundles. Uh, in this side, you get a generalization of the Teichmuller space. So this is, these are the higher Teichmuller components. On this side, you get a generalization of the Hitchin components that were parameterized by quadratic differentials. And um, the way these appear, just very briefly, um, the special thing about the split real forms is that there's, special you know, there's an irreducible representation of SL2R that lies in each one of these. So if you take a representation corresponding to a point in Teichmuller space and compose it with the irreducible representation into the split real form, then that defines representations in here. And the higher Teichmuller components are the components of representations which deform to one of these. Um, on the Higgs bundle side, the Hitchin components that you get generalize the components which were parameterized by quadratic differentials. The quadratic differentials were actually the base of the fibration for the case of SL2C. Um, and the Hitchin component was parameterized by these by picking a section of this fibration. And that construction, uh, existence of a section of this vibration which picks out a component in here uh, is the, the way that these Hitchin components um, appear for the split real forms. Um, so the one, okay, so this, don't, don't panic, this is not as, uh, not as scary as it looks, but this is the example that is really the relevant one for our new SOPQ per, uh, components. So this is what happens for the Hitchin components for the split real forms SOPP plus 1. Um, so these are, according to this picture, parameterized by the base of the Hitchin vibration for SO2P plus 1. And uh, that contains not only quadratic differentials, but uh, differentials of all even powers from 1 to 2P. Um, the bundles in these Hitchin components, just like these bundles, are fixed. They're constrained to have a particular form. They have to be um, sums of powers of the canonical bundle. And the Higgs field, I mean, this is an SOPQ, uh, so it has to be compatible with the, uh, quadra the uh, orthogonal structures on these bundles. So it has to be of this diagonal form. But the, uh, the, the information in this co sector that I've called eta, that's what goes where the star is, I've illustrated in this diagram. So what we have in this diagram are um, we have the, the, uh, the, the sum ends in the two bundles distribute, you know, alternating from the sum end of V to the sum end of W. And then the arrows are the non-zero components of the Higgs field. So the Higgs field is a map from W to V twisted by K. It has you know, many components corresponding to this decomposition. These arrows indicate where they lie. Notice that these ones are all non-zero. These are uh, essentially the identity. Uh, you might wonder, how do you get an identity from the pth power to the p minus first power? And the reason is that these are Higgs fields, so there's a twisting by the canonical bundle, which isn't in this picture. But if you put that in, then that would be a map from k to p to k to the p. So this is, uh, this is the way the uh, Higgs bundles in the Hitchin component for SOPP plus 1 look. And quickly memorize that, because this pattern will appear again in a couple of slides. Um, OK, so that's, uh, that, that's what happens um, uh, for the split real forms. For the forms, real forms of Hermitian type, so that was the other type of family that appeared in the case of SL2R and for which I said you get uh, exotic components. So there, the relevant features are a little bit different. So the example we saw, SL2R, 
uh, everything is a sum of a bundle, sum of two bundles, and the Higgs field is diagonal with respect to that. That's a general feature for these for, uh, real forms of Hermitian type. Um, there's a, a essentially integer valued invariant here. It was just the degree of L. In some of the other cases, uh, it's not exactly an integer. It's, a, in, you know, it's a integer multiples of some constant. Um, but there's a bound which, from the Higgs bundle point of view, you can see as a consequence of the stability criterion. Uh, when the obvious invariant hits its maximal value, um, the structure of the bundle specializes in the, in the way that in SL2R, L had to be a square root of the canonical bundle. There's something sort of analogous that, that always happens. Um, and so you get new invariants appearing because the structure has specialized. Um, so the maximal component decomposes into components labeled by a new invariant. Uh, each piece labeled by this new invariant acquires a new interpretation, which we'll see coming up as well. Um, it's like a moduli space of Higgs bundles for a different group, except now the Higgs field is not twisted by the canonical bundle, but by the square of the canonical bundle. So this is a K squared twisted G prime Higgs bundle for a, different, for a companion group G prime. Um, so uh, I want to try and work through the way that looks for this particular example, because again, this is the one that is relevant for the SOPQ. Um, so in this case, uh, so this is an example of a, a group of Hermitian type. Uh, the Higgs bundle, this is an SOPQ, so it, the bundle has to be a sum of a rank 2 and a rank Q. Um, the rank 2 bundle is now an SO2, so again it has to decompose, or it can be put in this form of a blind bundle plus its dual. Where here, okay, here I've, I've shown you what the orthogonal structure looks like with respect to that decomposition. Uh, w is a rank Q orthogonal bundle, so no special form for that. Um, and the component, the part of the Higgs field that I've called eta is now a map from W to L plus L inverse, so it has two pieces that I've labeled there in a diagram similar to the one that we saw for the, uh, for the Hitchin components where we label the uh, sum ends in the bundles and put in arrows for the components in the Higgs fields, this is what the Higgs field looks like for an SO2Q Higgs bundle. So you get a quiver diagram like this. In this case, there are actually two invariants. One of them is an integer. It's the degree of L. There are also invariants for the bundle W. This is an orthogonal bundle, so its degree is zero, but it has Stiefel-Whitney classes. Um, in principle, it has two but uh, in this example, this little zero down there means that we've taken the com connected component of the identity of this group. And for that restriction, uh, that, that, that uh, implies that the first Stiefel-Whitney class of W is necessarily zero. So we're left with just the second Stiefel-Whitney class, which lives in H2 with Z2 coefficients. Um, so there are actually two labels, but th this is the one that... Uh, participates in the Hermitian symmetric story. Um, there's a bound on this, which you can see in this case by looking at the composition of the, of the map, this part of the Higgs field, and it's transposed with respect to the orthogonal structure. That gives you a map from L to L inverse, and at each stage, remember, we've twisted by the canonical bundle. So this is a map from L to L inverse K squared. And stability says that that can't be zero, so you get a degree on the bound of L from that condition. Um, there it is. So that's the bound in this case. So now we get a you know, primary decomposition of the moduli space um, into sectors labeled by the degree of L and also this uh, second Stiefel-Whitney class. That's also a legitimate label. Um, but we get something special happening when uh, the invariant here is maximal, has its maximal value. 
and again, it comes from the fact that uh, when that happens, this is really a section of a degree zero bundle, so it says the bundle must be trivial and the section must be nowhere vanishing. Um, and that specializes the structure of the SO2Q Higgs bundle. It fixes L to be essentially, uh, so it's, it's, it's got to be the canonical bundle twisted by a square root of the trivial bundle. Um, so the only thing that you're allowed to vary is I, which uh, has two to the two G possibilities, point of order two in the Jacobian, if you like. Uh, also, the rank Q bundle has to decompose into I plus a rank Q minus one orthogonal bundle. So this picture has become this picture, where uh, W has split into I plus W naught. And here are all the pieces of the Higgs field that um, you're allowed. So now if you look at, uh, at this diagram, we can reinterpret the information that we have in there in a new way. Um, if you look at the information uh, down in this part, um, that B, this piece, beta naught, is a map from the rank Q minus 1 orthogonal bundle to the square where the point of order 2 twisted by the canonical bundle. That's down there. The information here is really I, W naught, and beta naught. And that information, if apart from the fact that there's a square there, defines a Higgs bundle for, for the group SO1, Q minus 1. So this part of the diagram defines a point in this space, a K squared twisted Higgs bundle for the group SO1, Q minus 1. If you look at what's left, the only thing that's, um, okay, so we've got, we've got the, the K is fixed, uh, and this, I, for whatever I is, A2 here is a, a map from I to I, let's see, did I write it correctly? Uh, yeah, you can write it as a map from I to I, K, twisted by K. So that's a quadratic differential. Uh, it's some, uh, for... Part of this story, it would be convenient to reinterpret it as a K-squared twisted Higgs bundle for the group SO11, but that's not so important for us here. Um, it, so what the bottom line is that um, the maximal component where, tau, where the parameter tau has its maximal value decomposes into pieces labeled by uh, the choices of the point of order 2, and for each choice, the space that you get is a product of this one with that one. This one is a moduli space of k-squared twisted Higgs bundles for this group, and this one is a, a power of, is a space of sections of quadratic differentials. Um, so there's the exotic components in this example. Um, so okay, so let me. Let me, with all that preparation, now tell you about what we, what we find for SOPQ. So this, I mean, this includes SO2Q, uh, and it includes SOPP plus 1, or, or uh, we'll see more relevantly SOP minus 1P. Um, but it, uh, those are just special cases of this. And outside of those special cases, this is not in either of those special classes of groups. Um, and so um, here's, a, uh, here's a crude summary of the results. So this is, so again, let me just uh, acknowledge my collaborators, Collier, Gothen, Garcia, Prada, and Oliveira. Um, uh, so uh, what the result is, the result says is that uh, for, for any of these SOPQs, there are extra components not detected by the topological invariants um, whose union is isomorphic to this space. So this, these pieces look like what we saw for the SO2Q and the SOP P minus 1, except here, instead of being twisted by K squared, it's twisted by K to the P. And here, instead of just having quadratic differentials, we have a sum of all the even powers up to 2P minus 2. <clears throat> um, so... Uh, let me tell you, so what I want to do uh, for in the next uh, 10 minutes or so 
is give you some idea of um, why um, why there was sort of some expectation that these components might be there, or what the evidence was that there ought to be some exotic components in this case, and then just say a couple words about uh, sort of the, the, you know, the precise thing that we actually proved. Um, so, um, ah, uh, but before we get there, right, I was going to make this a little bit more precise. Uh, so let me, sorry, I forgot about this. Um, so here, the result, you know, I've said that the exotic components, uh, the union all looks like this space. Um, the invariance, the, the obvious topological invariance in this example, SOPQ, are the Stiefel-Whitney classes for the orthogonal bundle V and the orthogonal bundle W. So in principle, four invariants, two first Stiefel-Whitney's and two second Stiefel-Whitney's, but because of the S over there, the first Stiefel-Whitney classes are linked. So um, there's really three invariants, uh, one first Stiefel-Whitney class and two second Stiefel-Whitney classes. And so there's, a, there's a, a component for each of those which is detected just by those topological invariants. Um, and the exotic ones don't occur for all possible values of this. Um, in the cases where these second Stiefel-Whitney class of V is not zero, you only get the component that uh, is labeled by the obvious invariance. The exotic ones um, occur in these sectors where the second Stiefel-Whitney class of V is zero. Um, so these, this component that I've labeled with a zero um, are the ones... Uh, where, which are labeled just by the topological invariance. And another way of characterizing those is to say that those are the Higgs bundles where you can deform the Higgs field to vanish, and you're left with just orthogonal bundles. Um, in the others, you can't do that. Uh, in the others, uh, so in the exotic components, the structure of the Higgs bundles all is captured in this diagram. So like the uh, uh, SOP P plus 1 example, there's a part that is determined just by powers of the canonical bundle uh, that fully describes V. W has a part like that and a rank. So this is a rank P minus 1 piece. This is a rank P piece. So this has to be a rank Q minus P plus 1. And that's, uh, that's, that's the... the um, uh, this is the analog of what we got in the SO2Q example. So this is the structure of the Higgs bundle, of the bundle, and the arrows indicate the structure of the Higgs field uh, for every point in these exotic components. And you'll notice that some of these arrows have ones on them, so they can never vanish. So you can see that uh, you can't deform this away to, for the Higgs field to vanish completely. Um, okay, so let me just look a little bit more closely at, at, uh, at this diagram. Uh, and this is the way the Higgs bundles look in this exotic component. If you look at the, pass at the part at the top of the diagram, that's exactly what we saw for SOP P plus 1, except now this is SOP minus 1 P. Um, but so this part of the diagram parameterizes, I mean, represents a point in that moduli space, and the rest of the diagram, the part in red here, uh, encodes data for an SO1, this is the rank of W0, Higgs bundle, but now this is a map from W0 to this power of the canonical bundle with an extra K, because everything is twisted by K, so that's why there's a K to the P over there. Um, so uh, that's where the two pieces of the, um, of, of, in the description of the component come from or how they're encoded in this, this diagram. Okay, so uh, now I can tell you about some of the evidence that there was for why, we, why there, sh the, you know, it, there ought to be these components. So the first is, is evidence from... Uh, the function that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that serves as a Morse function on the moduli space of Higgs bundles. 
Um, so even though these spaces aren't necessarily smooth, the fact that this is a proper map uh, you know, means that it attains its local min on all connected components. So you get information about the connected components by identifying the local minima. Um, okay, so in the case of SOPQ, uh, right, this was, I've written this for SLN. Here's what it looks like for SOPQ. The, the function is really the, the L2 norm of this part of the Higgs field. Um, so this function, either in this case or that case, clearly it has glo a global minimum at zero. Um, and uh, that's attained on the components that uh, are labeled by zero before, where the Higgs field can be deformed to, to vanish. Um, but uh, so if there are other local minima, then that holds out the possibility that there could be other components. And um, this was detected uh, by Marta Arroyo in her PhD thesis in 2009. She was a student of Oscar Garcia Prada. And she um, found local minima for this function on SOPQ where the Higgs field did not vanish. And they had this form. So this is uh, the diagram that we've had up a few times, but with only these arrows. All the other arrows have been, have been set to zero. So, um, I mean, this, this doesn't prove that there are other local, the other connected components, but it uh, allows for that possibility. So this was the, uh, the first piece of evidence. Uh, the second piece of evidence um, was from Brian's results for these split real forms, SOPP plus one. Um, so... Um, uh, this was a generalization of results for the special case SO23, which, so SO23 is almost SP4R. Those groups are isogenous, but uh, SP4R is a double cover of SO23. And in uh, both those cases, so, so in SP4R, um, the, it was known that there were extra exotic components um, first detected by Peter Gothen, and uh, Brian's analysis of uh, the case SOPP plus one found analogous exotic components uh, for any P for these uh, split real forms. So these are components. Uh, I mean, we know that uh, since this is a split real form, there are Hitchin components, but these are components, uh, I mean, others, not the Hitchin components. So in fact, there um, are components labeled by an integer d um, that, uh, let's see, did I put it somewhere up here? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, can range between um, 0 and p times 2g minus 2. Um, at, at the maximum value, these are the Hitchin components, but uh, Brian actually described, uh, not only detected them, but described them for the other values of d as well. Um, if you... Uh, so this is uh, for every value of d. If you take all, all the components, uh, all the e even d's and all the odd d's, um, then the union of those actually gives you the uh, special case of the um, kp twisted uh, so one q minus p plus one Higgs bundles that we saw in the SOPQ example. So this was a special case. Um, I mean, now we can say it's a special case, but it was a, 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 uh, um, an indication of uh, extra components in SOPQs. Um, there was one other stream of evidence, and uh, I know I'm going to gobble this explanation, um, but so you, 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 can talk to, can, you can talk to my collaborator, Brian, afterwards if you want a more coherent explanation. But uh, so this was evidence from the other side of the non-abelian Hodge correspondence. So the, uh, you know, the, what I described uh, before, the Morse theory evidence and the SOPP plus one came out of Higgs bundle analysis. But um, so uh, Olivia Gishard and Anna Vinhart um, analyzed the, uh, um, I mean, had a prediction for the representation variety, the corresponding representation variety for SOPQ. Um, which came out of their work analyzing what, uh, so what the, I mean, what these things have in common, the Hitchin representations and the maximal representations for the symmetric case, those are the two cases where exotic components 
are known, uh, in both of those cases, the representations in these exotic components all have this special property known as the, you know, that they're Anosov representations as defined by Labouris' concept of Anosov. Um, what Olivia and Anna uh, showed was that uh, there's actually a, perhaps a more subtle property at work here which relies on a positivity notion for a group and actually a group and a parabolic subgroup of it, uh, which both in both of these cases you have, but they showed that this property uh, can occur more generally than in these two cases. Um, and they, well, first of all, they, they conjectured that when the group has this positivity property, then there ought to be additional exotic components. Um, and it turns out that the only case not included by these two classes of groups, okay, except for some exceptional groups, but the only other case is SOPQ. So um, this suggests that there ought to be exotic components of SOPQ uh, which have this property that they identified. Um, let's see, I should stop in two minutes. So, um, all right, so I'll just uh, quickly summarize uh, what we actually did. So, I mean, once we had finally sort of understood what the components ought to look like, then uh, showing that you have components like that amounts to finding a map from what they, the space that they ought to be into the moduli space where you think it should live. Um, the uh, w one slight uh, wrinkle here is that these are moduli spaces of isomorphism classes of objects. What I've been writing down has mostly been just objects, not isomorphism classes. Uh, in fact, the description of the map from data in the, the space that describes the components into the big moduli space is really a map on objects, not isomorphism classes. So um, what, what we showed was, first of all, that, that this actually does define a map on the, between the moduli spaces. And then we, we showed that the map is, you know, has the right properties to actually define a component. So it's closed and it's open. Um, and uh, so, uh, okay, so the, the first one's checking, showing that, that you actually have a map. You, you more or less do just by direct observation, direct computation and observation. Uh, to show that the map is closed, the Hitchin vibration actually plays an important role there. Um, because you want, to, you, know, you, you want to show that the map is closed. One way to do that is to show that if you have a divergent sequence, then the, the, the image under the map is also divergent. And if the sequence is divergent, uh, using the Hitchin vibration, really the only way you, you, know, you can detect when a sequence is divergent, because it diverges in the base of the Hitchin vibration. Um, uh, and that's a sort of a, a convenient tool for showing that the map is closed. Uh, showing that the map is open, we actually could show really a, a bit more than that. I mean, we, um, we could show that the, uh, the, der the der derivative of the map is a local isomorphism, so that locally this is a diffeomorphism, so it's open. Um, and, but for that, you need a good model of um, local neighborhoods of the moduli space. Um, and... Uh, that's really where sort of the, the, the work goes. Um, so, okay, that's all I'll say about uh, the, the, the proof. So, you know, one obvious question that uh, has yet to be answered is whether these components that we've detected are actually the same as the components predicted by the, the representation variety picture uh, in uh, the Gishard Vinhart conjecture. So in other words, are the, are the representations in the components corresponding to our exotic components, are they the ones that have the correct positivity property? Um, and uh, stay tuned, we'll tell you at the next atelier. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs>